when I was a youngster, I wasn't very fond of vegetables. Not all that much fonder of them as an adult, but really didn't like them as a kid. And whenever I'd put up a fuss, you know, and just kind of push them to the side of my plate and work on the other stuff and kind of leave them for last, hoping I could hold out, my mom would always have this saying that she would say, kept saying it through life and now she says it to my children and that saying is suffering is good for the soul I hated when she said that (sighs) didn't make me like vegetables anymore when I heard that and I guess I didn't like it too because I realized that there's a nugget of truth in that and later in life I would discover that nugget of truth is in the Bible And it's in this fifth chapter in the book of Romans, this letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to the early church at Rome. I've been preaching through the book of Romans, picking out different passages to focus on. And today I want to look at verses 3, 4, and 5 in that chapter because the Apostle Paul is outlining a process of moving from suffering to hope talks about it being basically like three stages and um, well he seems pretty excited about it when he writes about it in fact he says in this passage that he rejoices in suffering now some people might read that and think well that's a little weird maybe he's a masochist or something but no what Paul is saying is that in his own experience he has found that suffering can lead to positive things and Paul suffered a lot Paul was beaten, he was imprisoned, he was shipwrecked. I mean, he went through a whole lot of stuff. So when he says this, it makes me want to pay attention because I want to know what he learned because I'm hoping that I can gain and maybe you can gain some insight into this whole process of passing through suffering in a way that we're strengthened and end up at a place of hope. The process, Paul says, basically, I just want to say it at the outset, Paul says that suffering produces endurance or perseverance. And this endurance produces character, a strength of character. And that strengthening of character then leads to hope. So I just want to walk through this process and break it down a little bit so that we can understand a little more clearly That first step, suffering produces endurance. And I'm looking now at the insert that's in your bulletin. It's a white sheet if you want to follow along. The word there for endurance can sometimes be interpreted as perseverance. The term suffering in this uh, verse actually refers to pressure. If you look at the original biblical language here, um, and when you think about suffering, it is kind of a form of pressure. Um, Suffering can be oppressive. If you're anxious and you're worried and you're, 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 you're all worked up about something, we talk about feeling like we have a weight on our shoulders or we talk about having a heavy heart, a sense of weight or pressure. Uh, that's what Paul's talking about. And even though we don't usually enjoy the experience of being pressured, Paul suggests that Christians can endure when they know that they're being made stronger, that it's producing endurance. Now, when I think of endurance or perseverance, I think of a couple of things. One is um, athletes who train, say, for an Olympic event. In order to get ready, they do all this training. You know, they might uh, lift weights or they run sprints or they do push-ups or whatever. Well, and they don't do that because it's fun. It hurts. It's a form of suffering doing all that training. But it's getting them ready for an event that's coming. For instance, if it's a running event and they've been running, they've been running sprints or running long distance or whatever their event is, then when they're in the race, their body is used to being tested that way because it's been tested before in the training. And so when they get in the event and they're feeling exhausted, they can endure because they've done it before. That's kind of the thing that Paul's talking about when he says that suffering produces endurance. And as Jack shared with the children this morning in the kids' message, soldiers who train get ready for what they might experience out on the battlefield. 
They learn how to use weapons and equipment. And uh, they train by going on long uh, journeys, by walking or running, whatever they do to get ready, to prepare themselves, to build their endurance so that they can persevere. Paul suggesting in these verses that if there is some purpose in our suffering, it's a little easier to endure. If you feel that you're just suffering for suffering's sake, it makes it more difficult to go through, doesn't it? That's when we ask those questions like, why is this happening to me? I feel like there's a cloud over my head and it just keeps raining on me. But if we can know, as Paul suggests, that God is doing something with us in the midst of our struggle, developing us, shaping us. Max Lucado has written a book called On the Anvil. And he says that the Christian life is kind of like, you know, the blacksmith with the anvil. You know, he sticks a piece of metal in the fire. Ow! If we're that metal, puts it on the anvil and starts banging on it. Ow! More suffering. Why? Because it's being shaped into something useful. And that's kind of where Paul is going with this kind of language when he says suffering produces endurance. C.S. Lewis, the Christian writer, wrote a book about pain. And he said something very interesting about pain that I've been reflecting on. He said that pain is God's megaphone. When we're in pain, God has our attention. When we're just sailing along in life and everything's going great, everything's coming together, everything's working out, we just kind of go on our way and go on our own strength usually. But then... When things start to fall apart, when things start to unravel, that's when we start saying, where are you, God? God has our attention. So if there's a purpose in this suffering, it kind of helps us even just mentally to realize that God's in this because God's promised to be with me in whatever I go through. He, He wants to be my shepherd. He wants me to be his sheep. He wants me to follow. He wants me to trust and obey. So in our suffering, there's a building of endurance or perseverance. The next step is that the endurance then produces character, he says in verse 4. Character. Well, what's character? Character is what you're made of. It's your personality. It's your beliefs. It's what your integrity is made of. It's your, your habits that you maintain. All of this is part of your character. While some may be tempted to quit in the face of suffering, the believer can be driven closer to Christ. A Christian, I don't remember their name, was once quoted as saying, we are like nails. The harder you hit us, the deeper you drive us. Sometimes suffering proves us. It's like that metal in the fire. All the soft stuff burns away and what's, what remains gets tougher and stronger. I remember hearing a quote by Beethoven, the great composer, you know, who went deaf Imagine what that was like, being a composer and losing your hearing. When the doctor told Beethoven that he was going to go deaf, which was, you know, again, thunderous news. How could he do what he did, what he was gifted to do? It is said that Beethoven responded by saying, then I'll grab the world by the throat. He wasn't giving up. He was going to be suffering. He was going to be facing this loss, but he wasn't giving in. He was going to bear down and work harder. Sometimes suffering does that for you and me if we're looking at it that way as something that God is using to help us. If we can see ourselves on a divine anvil and that God is is allowing this suffering to happen because God's going to use it to speak to us in that megaphone and to reshape us. I... uh, I get emails from a missionary who serves in Taiwan and China. His name is Denny Craker. He's been there for years. And what he does is he trains ministers. He goes there and he, he teaches them how to be a pastor and uh, empowers them to go out and serve these churches. But it's all done underground because where he's at, the Christian church is not accepted. It's all got to be done in secret. And when Denny sends emails out to his, uh, you know, prayer partners, he does it in code. 
he can't say the word God. So he refers to God as the CEO. And he refers to the ministers that he's training as the managers. So when he sends the email, he says, well, the CEO is very pleased. The training went well. And all the managers are uh, up to date and they're doing well. This is the kind of language in case that email gets into the wrong hands. And he's told the story about meeting with pastors way out in the country in a barn where it's cold and they're sitting on benches with no back for three days, all day, as he's teaching them and training them. And one of the ministers stands at the door as a guard to see a lookout if anybody's coming because you're not allowed to do that over there. How would you like to live like that? Wow. How would you like to have that kind of faith? Will you be willing to take that kind of risk? This is what this Christian is saying about being driven harder. If you're going to make me suffer, you're going to take away something from me, well, then I'm going to bear down in Christ, and I'm going to lean more heavily on Christ. And that's what often happens when suffering comes. We have to make up our minds whether we're going to give up, fall apart, or bear down and work harder at looking for Christ in the midst of our struggle and in the midst of our suffering, knowing that that suffering can produce an endurance that leads to stronger character, Christian character. And finally, the last step in the process, Paul says in verse 5, is that character produces hope. And wow, hope is important. Can't live without hope. Hope is that confidence regarding tomorrow. The disciple of Christ can emerge from trials as a stronger and purer believer. The end result of this process is hope. And as it says in verse 5, hope does not disappoint us because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. You notice anything different about the sanctuary this morning? Somebody said it. It's in red. These are called paraments. No extra charge for the information, by the way. These uh, drapings are called paraments, and they're tied to seasons in the church. And today is Pentecost Sunday. It's the day to remember when the Holy Spirit came down upon those early followers and really created the first church. Jesus promised us the Holy Spirit. The Spirit is alive. The Spirit is the comforter. It's the Holy Spirit that, that guides us and helps us in day-to-day -day living. And the Scripture is saying here in verse 5, Hope doesn't disappoint us because God's love is poured into our hearts through that same Holy Spirit. And if you don't have that love of Christ and you don't have that Holy Spirit in you, then you don't have hope. The world needs hope. When I think of hopelessness, I think of that movie Castaway with Tom Hanks. Anybody seen that movie? Good, a lot of you have, because I want to say a word about it. Tom Hanks plays this character, right? He's a castaway. He's shipwrecked on an island. He's all by himself. He went down on a plane. He's the only one to survive. He's on this, he ends up being on this island for years, and um, things wash up on the beach from the crash, one of which is a volleyball. What's the volleyball's name? Wilson. Why does he name it Wilson. Wilson Sporting Goods, right? That's my guess. So yeah, so he's so lonely, he actually takes this volleyball, kind of paints a face on it, and starts talking to the volleyball. Hey, he's all alone, you know, for years on a deserted island. It's lonely. And I'm sure he felt hopeless. And he wanted interaction. He longed to dialogue with someone, but there was nobody else there. So he creates Wilson. And he has conversations with Wilson, right? He argues with Wilson. Starts yelling at Wilson. And then later in the movie, he comes to a conclusion. He's going to die on this island all by himself. So he might as well try to get off. If he dies trying, he hasn't lost anything. So he makes a raft, right? He puts some supplies on the raft. He gets out past the initial waves, and now he's out in the ocean floating, him and Wilson. But then there's the storm that comes, 
and things get rough. And Wilson, the volleyball, gets away from him and is floating away. And Tom Hanks' character is on the raft. And you see in his face and hear in his voice the despair and the hopelessness as he cries out, Wilson! Wilson! And they just show the volleyball bobbing in the water, floating away. And there goes his hope. Some some of us may feel that way sometimes. You may know people that feel that way. Their hope was in something or someone, and it floats away, or it's taken away, or it falls apart, whatever it is. And we feel all alone, and we feel like we don't have any hope anymore. And for the hopeless, Jesus says, I have come to give you hope. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Come and learn of me. I want to be your shepherd. I want to be your friend. I want to be your companion for life. I want to pour my love into you through the power of the Holy Spirit. You know, when you do that, when you accept Christ as the one who died in your place because you've sinned as I have sinned, when you do that, things change for you. Your status is altered. And speaking of altars, you know, one of the privileges of a minister is to officiate at weddings Bride and the groom stand here. You go through the ceremony. I have a great view. I get to see their face. And when I say to them, or say to the groom, you may now kiss the bride. Oh, the joy, that expression. And they turn to each other, and it's usually not just a quick little peck on the lips. I've seen some serious kisses at the altar. And what I see in the expression is their altered status. They're no longer single. That's no longer their fiancé. It's their wife. It's their husband. Life has changed. Everything is different in that moment. And you can see it on their face. And so it is for every person who trusts in Christ. I'm no longer alone. I'm no longer just a deserted sinner. In Christ, the Bible says I'm a new creature. I'm a new creation. I'm born from above. I get a new start. I have hope. Thanks be to God. Believers can survive the pressures of life knowing that pressure can lead to hope. Our hope is rooted in the love of God made manifest in the cross of Calvary. Verse 8 says it best, folks. God proves his love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You get that? God didn't wait for you to get your act together to die for you. He doesn't wait till you mature a little bit more or, or stop some of those bad habits. His love was there way back in the beginning. And because of that, we have new life and we have hope in this life that we can move from suffering, developing endurance and character, to hope. Last example, there was a father I read about, he and his son walking through the woods, they found a cocoon, and uh, the dad thought, wow, this would be kind of a teaching moment, you know, bring the cocoon home, we'll sort of watch, you know, learn some science, nature, and watch the butterfly emerge from the cocoon. So they had the cocoon for a while, um, but nothing was happening. But one thing that was happening was the cocoon was shaking, like the butterfly was trying to get out, but it couldn't. It just was shaking the cocoon. So the dad took a pen knife and cut a slit in it. And sure enough, out pops one wing, out popped the other wing, and then the butterfly came out. But the problem was the butterfly wasn't flying. The butterfly was just sort of, you know, stumbling around. They didn't know what was wrong. So the father uh, contacted the science teacher at the local high school told him the whole story. We found this cocoon, brought it in. The cocoon was shaking like he couldn't get out, so we cut a slit in it. The science teacher said, well, that was your mistake. Father said, what do you mean? Teacher said, you see, it's in the struggle to get out of the cocoon that the butterfly's wings are strengthened so that when it finally bursts out, it has the strength to fly. 
You took away the struggle. Now it can't fly. And so it may be in your life and mine. Lord, why is this happening to me? I feel pressure. I'm suffering. I'm struggling. Well, maybe your wings are getting stronger. Maybe you're on the anvil and God is working with you and there's, there's more in store for you. And God's getting you and me ready by making us stronger, building our endurance, strengthening our character, leading us in the path of hope. Thanks be to God for a Savior, Jesus Christ, who is risen. Risen indeed. The tomb is empty. And because the tomb is empty, we have hope. Amen? Amen. Lord, thanks for the teaching of the Holy Scriptures. Thank you for Paul's letter to the Romans. And thank you for this word about suffering. Because I'm guessing, Lord, some in this room are at a place of suffering right now. And so I would ask, Lord, in closing, that you would help them, move them through this time of suffering. Don't leave them in a time of suffering, but lead them through. And along the way, build their endurance and character and bring them to a place of great hope in Jesus Christ. Amen.